And as you guys do that, I'm going to share my screen. And we're going to start today here. Okay. All right, uh, everybody, everybody can hear me okay? Everybody can see my, the screen that says Introduction to Restoration Ecology Concepts? Yep. 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 Okay, cool, great, awesome. Again, just as a quick reminder, uh, wait, why does it say 2016? That's lame, what the hell, that's wrong. Uh, anyway, um, it's 2020 actually, it's not 2016. Um, so just a quick reminder, um, as we're going through today, uh, I will tr uh, when we pause, I'll try to check the chat, but again, it's hard for me to check the chat. So if something's weird, if something's hung up or, I'm, I go silent or something, please just unmute yourself and, and, and uh, yell at me. Same thing with questions. If you could just unmute yourself and say, hey, Dr. A, I got a question. I'll pause. So um, great. Uh, with that, um, as a sort of uh, lead into, I know people are still coming in. Actually, let me first say that, uh, apologize for the weirdness with um, Canvas. Uh, some people could see things, other people couldn't. I, I couldn't fully understand why. I, I, I tried resetting the dates and everything. I think it's all fixed now. Um, I pushed the date, so typically Friday is our deadline. I, I moved the deadline for stuff this week, the quiz, et cetera, to uh, uh, this weekend so that you guys have have a chance to do it. So I've also, I'm not gonna be sharing readings the way I was trying before. Again, some people could see it, some people couldn't, some people needed permissions and it was, it was unclear to me why it was doing that. So I'm just going to be uploading documents directly into a canvas from here on out. So I apologize for the confusion. Um, but uh, everything should be on right now. You should be able to take the quizzes and 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 um, when they're active and, uh, and and access the readings, et cetera. So again, sorry for the whatever confusion you had. Um, from here on out, it should all be working uh, and you shouldn't need special queries or whatever to, to get access to stuff. Um, and so uh, I presume it'll go okay. If, it's, if something still isn't working, by all means, still poke me again and, and, and say, hey, Dr. I, I still can't read the whatever um, uh, thing. Okay, cool. Um, awesome. So we haven't really talked about content yet. So, so let's talk about content. Um, our readings this week were about the general concept of restoration. Uh, next week, our readings will get into a general introduction to wetlands. And so I want to um, really get into our first discussion of, of what is restoration today. And so again, you guys can chime in whenever you like, but, uh, but let's get going. Before we get into those concepts, though, I wanted to throw out a couple ideas that, uh, and quotes that I think are, are relevant to our course, particularly a course on, on the conceptualization of restoration and the theory of restoration. Um, and so uh, just two slides here. I'll read through these quotes. This first one is from Edward Tufte. Does anybody, uh, you guys can unmute if you want to say something. Has anybody heard of Edward Tufte before out of curiosity? No. No. Okay, great. Well, not great, but, but okay. So um, Edward Tufte is an old dude now. But uh, he really, um, he was a statistician uh, uh, and morphed into an artist. Uh, but he really was one of the first real big pushers over the you know, 20 years ago um, to get data to be presented elegantly and to not follow the traditional conventions, but to do whatever is gonna work to be, to effectively communicate information. He was one of the, folks, even though he's a statistician, he was one of the folks that was called in to figure out when the Space Shuttle Challenger blew up, to figure out why it blew up and, you know, because he was such a good communicator and communication was one of the big problems they had in that, um, uh, miscommunication was one of the problems we had in um, that disaster. Anyway, but what, what and, and I used to take you guys to his, he used to do um, seminars around the country. So for the first couple of years at CSUCI, I, I used to get IRA money and take my classes down to um, to visit him when he was in when he would do an LA uh, sort of day long lecture. Anyway, um, he has a bunch of great books. If you guys are interested in data and presenting data, he's got a bunch of really cool uh, books. Um, but he said, "Borrow strength, and don't have too much hubris." Um, 
as we're as we're getting into restoration, it, it it's uh, might be a little bit hard for you guys to understand the history since you're you're so um, so young and the field has a, a evolved just so rapidly. But the long story short is um, restoration is a fantastic tool, but it has not always been viewed as a tool. And a lot of traditional academics and originally agency folks too, uh, poo pooed it and kind of thought, oh, this is, you know, this is not a, a sophisticated tool or a helpful tool. Um, I think that's mostly gone now, but, but uh, it was strange in the early days when we had this tool to help with ecological functioning and all these things. And some people didn't seem to be particularly uh, interested in, in uh, engaging with that tool. Uh, the next is from a, uh, a X-Files quote, or from, from the, the TV series X-Files. And uh, uh, the, the character um, uh, comes up and, and says, or, or uh, Fox Mulder or somebody says, hey, you know, do you have any swamps around here? He's looking for monsters. And the sheriff says, uh, we used to have swamps, only the EPA made us take to calling them wetlands. So there's also a, a, a theme that you'll see um, in these, these early readings, which is um, academics fighting over terminology or, 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 or people like, well, this is, we, shouldn't, we should call it this instead of that. And, this, that. and of course, terminology is important. Any, any discipline, any foreign language, anybody has their, their, their ways of communicating an idea, a concept, and those are important. Um, and, and we should know those, those concepts and those terms. Um, but they shouldn't ever obscure the real goal, which is, you know, ecological functioning, uh, restoration of, of species and things of that nature. And sometimes we get a little bit um, hung up in our, in our terminology. The next one is, again, from this battle uh, that's still kind of going on, but, but, is, but was really, really raging about 20 years ago related to restoration. And that is um, uh, this notion of application clarifying importance. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, um, uh, again, in this, in this sort of initial battle in the early years of, of mainstream scientists thinking and biologists and ecologists thinking that restoration wasn't that important a thing um, and that it was something you do off the side, but the real science was done by, um, by you know, real PhD people and stuff of that nature, which is incredibly arrogant. But, um, but there's, there historically has just been this, this disrespect and um, dismissal of applied science relative to basic science. So basic science is the, is the hard stuff. Basic science is the important stuff. Basic science, what we should all be doing. And the folks that can't do that, they do some applied stuff over here. That They go work for Caltrans or they go do something over here because they couldn't make it is, is really the, the implication historically with that. This has changed a lot, although at our big research universities, it hasn't changed that much. Um, but nevertheless, the idea here is that um, application is a key part of science, just like basic science is a key part. So, so trying to apply our theories and concepts to do a management action, that's great. We should all be doing that, right? One, it'll help with the management, but two, that application, that, that, that applied um, effort, when it works, great. If it doesn't work, oh my gosh, that means our theory is wrong. That means the basic understanding of how the system works is wrong. So therefore, restoration should be in a feedback loop with the rest of ecology and other sciences. And, and, and they both should inform one another. And this notion that historically they were, they were put into different bins is not effective, wasteful of energy, time, all that kind of stuff. And so that's what that idea there is. Application clarifies importance. Very similar term, the next one, restoration practice and ecological theory are reciprocals. Again, this was said at, at a meeting I was at, and it was sort of like a, a bit of a controversial statement, right? It, it's not, it's true, but, but historically um, our, our um, academic brothers and sisters haven't always seen it that way. Sorry, somebody had a question? No, okay. All right, then just a couple more quotes before we, we go on here. Um, one is by uh, Jane Lipchenko. She was a, a professor up I guess she still is, maybe she's emeritus, uh, up in Oregon. And then she eventually became the, the head of NOAA. 
Um, but uh, this was from a, a long address she gave a long time ago, and she's given the same address over the years and tweaks it a little bit. But um, a really, really key thing, and this, is, this really speaks to import, uh, um, our, our conceptualization of what restoration is, um, she was talking about um, climate change and other things, but, but uh, her, her statement was myth. Some things worked in the past, so it must work in the future. This is a huge deal across ESRM, right? So this is why people aren't evacuating in the wake of fires. This is why people aren't evacuating in the wake of hurricanes. This is why people think we don't need to invest in sea level rise infrastructure. because it all, And it goes on and on. It's because, well, in the past, we did X and we were okay. Or when we had a problem, we did Y, and that solved the problem. Similarly, in the context of restoration, some people think, oh, the, the river used to be here. So therefore, and then maybe the river got messed up. And so when it comes time to fixing the river, we need to put the river back in that same exact spot. Maybe, maybe that's the right thing to do, but maybe given different climate, different rainfall patterns, different, different animal abundances, maybe the river, should be over there as opposed to over here. So simply thinking, simply trying to recreate what was in the past um, isn't necessarily an effective path forward. Um, and then something we'll spend some more time talking, uh, talking about, but I'll just mention it here, but um, uh, this is a, a very important concept in restoration. It's called the field of dreams hypothesis. And, and I presume people, I, I should be careful. Have you guys seen the Kevin Gosler film, Field of Dreams? Anybody? Yes, I have. One. And I've seen the Benchwarmers two. parody. <laughs> okay, excellent. Excellent. So I got two or three people. Anybody else? No. Yeah, see? Wow. Okay. Um, so one thing you might want to do this weekend when you're uh, not able to do anything else and stuck at home or whatever, you might want to watch Field of Dreams. Anyway, um, the long story short, I don't want to spoil the movie for you, but... Um, uh, there's a dude who's an, a, a corn farmer in, in a big field, and he, he hears, hears things. And uh, he keeps hearing, if you build it, he will come. I don't, don't want to spoil the movie. But this idea is fundamental to restoration. And in a, a paper about 20 years ago, it was put forward by one of my, uh, my former professors, now colleagues, um, as a key thing. And the idea here is if you build it, it will come, right? So if we, if we dr drive the tractors around the hillside, right? And, we, and we, we make the hillside the way we want the hillside to be and let it go, this is, I'm simplifying it, and let it go, the plants and critters and birds and butterflies and bacteria and fungus and everybody will come back. It'll, it'll just happen on its own. Much of restoration is based on that. Much of restoration is based on sort of setting the stage for, for subsequent activities, and then just trusting in the ecological dynamics of the landscape, you know, it'll come on back. And uh, uh, it doesn't always work that way, I'll just say. So, so even though we all have this assumption that if we build it, it will come, if you build it, it may not come. And that was also a big, a big uh, a, a sort of controversial thing uh, at the time. Um, and then I'll just, I have more of these I'll share throughout the semester, but I'll just end with this one, which is um, from a Biona Wetland. So this is by uh, Salt Marsh by LAX in Los Angeles County, right at the um, mouth of what we was now Biona Creek, what used at one point was the mouth of the LA River. Um, and this was uh, the then head of the LA City Council. And she said at, at this conference around how we should what we should do with this wetland, how can we restore it, et cetera. Um, there's massive pressure to develop it and most of it has now been developed uh, into Playa del Rey and, and um, various uh, housing and, and business things. Anyway, she said, uh, we're not gonna bring back the giant sloth or the saber-toothed tiger, right? Things that were last here in Southern California um, in, in the Pleistocene, right? 14,000 years or so ago. Um, so we're not going to bring back the giant sloth, the saber-toothed tiger, and we're not going to restore an empty lot with 30 feet of fill over it. So her, that comment speaks to practicality. That it would be wonderful, I think it would be wonderful to have giant sloths run around. I think it'd be cool to see a saber-toothed tiger. I think that would be awesome. Um, but um, is that really realistic? 
Is that really, really realistic given our current constraints, given our current, um, current budget situation and, and, and political situation and social situation and all, all that stuff? So, so while it's important to be aspirational, especially in a class like this, where we're talking about theory and how, how we might do things, totally important. When, it gets, when we get down to actually doing the job of restoration, we, we're just constrained by reality. And that's not to, to give up or to be a wimp or to not have a backbone. It's just is, is accepting reality. And um, if, if folks really want to bring back uh, you know, a saber-toothed tiger, that's really cool. Maybe you should go talk to Bill Gates or, or Amazon or something where they have billions of dollars and years and years and years to spend on this sort of pet project. With restoration, it's... It's, it's important to restore the you know, well-functioning system, but it's also important to get the, the magnitude of stuff that we need. And if we're really focused on one small area, getting it to perfection, um, that might not be the best trade-off. It might be better to get tons and tons and tons of area, acres and acres and acres and acres of area that is um, functioning pretty well, um, might be, probably not perfectly, but pretty well, that's probably better to the ecological resilience and, and, and regional functioning of, of Southern California, Louisiana, Hawaii, wherever, uh, than just making it perfect. So anyway, just a few quotes to get us going. Uh, any thoughts on that or any questions about those? Professor? Yeah. In a situation like Louisiana, where the coastline is being de degraded constantly, mm -hmm. Sea level rise is going to come into play. What's going to happen to all their swamp land? Yeah, great question. Um, we'll talk about that um, in a future lecture. But, but um, for those that aren't as familiar, Louisiana is going away uh, very, very fast. Um, uh, without jumping, without spoiling the punchline in the future, basically our, our coastal wetlands are, in, are a dynamic system. So they're constantly being eroded and washed away by the ocean, and they're constantly being augmented by sediment being deposited from the terrestrial world. So it's this, it's this constant battle of, of things being added and things being taken away. And over time, they, it stays pretty similar, very similar to a coral reef. That the, there's you know, some years where there's more and some years there's less, but the biological activity of the critters there, in the case of coral reef, it's, it's, the, it's the coral themselves. In the case of our um, coastal wetlands, it's the vegetation. If we get a lot of sediment, you know, um, uh, plants can you know, will be fine. If the sediment goes away a little bit, the plants will grow up and tend to trap more sediment. So there's a, there's a positive feedback loop. What's going on in Louisiana though, is it's completely out of whack. It's completely out of balance. So Loretta's is asking about sea level rise and, and increasing um, height of the ocean. That's happening, but actually much more important, much more problematic than that is the addition of sediment, the addition of soils that were annually deposited on the floodplain that stopped. And that stopped basically in the 1950s because of the Army Corps of Engineers and, and the fact that we levied the Mississippi. So we no longer allowed that sediment to flood out into the Delta. Instead, the sediment sh rockets straight out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico and causes what we call the, the dead zone or the oxygen minimum zone and kills all kinds of fish and stuff. So, this, so, so the problem with Louisiana is partly sea level rise, but it's also, um, we're just not, we're just not uh, combating the, the regular day in, day out um, uh, uh, leaving of, of materials in the wetland. So the question then becomes, how are we gonna restore that? And it's a very difficult challenge. Um, uh, you guys should take my uh, New Orleans course if you want to really get into this, but, um, uh, there's a, there are abundant political pressures and power structures that are designed, that have set the system up to fail. And that would, and that I wouldn't say they want the system to fail, but they, they're not too interested in, in restoring the system. And um, many people that live in that area are, um, are basically becoming climate refugees. And, and, and if they aren't right now, they will be in the near future. 
Uh, there's some ports and terminals there, which mostly exist to service oil and gas, and then to an, a lesser extent, um, uh, agricultural exports. Those will be protected. The city of New Orleans will be protected around some, some walled city. Um, but for the folks that live outside those immediate areas, um, it's very difficult to see how we restore those systems. Um, and, and we'll talk more about that. We'll talk about Florida, the Everglades. We'll talk about Louisiana, we'll talk about the San Francisco Bay Area. These are, these are, are big problems. Um, and uh, there isn't necessarily an easy solution. I mean, there's an easy solution of adding sediment. <laughs> but, but as far as a practical sense, it, it is difficult in certain areas to do restoration uh, when the powers that be don't really think it's an important thing to do. So I'll just say that for now. Other questions? Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Okay. So uh, why should we do restoration in the first place? You know, I mean, what, what, what's, why even think about doing it? Well, um, we are, uh, through our actions, as probably everybody here knows, we've, we've reduced the, the wellness of our system. So integrity has been screwed up. Their ability to bounce back from stress or resilience is, has been screwed up. Um, their ability to perpetuate themselves, um, what we might call sustainability, has been degraded. And, and basically that's all uh, thanks to us. Um, some of the examples of stressors that we see or challenges to ecosystems include the introduction of things. So the, the adding of species that weren't historically there, the adding of physical structure that was not there. You can think of a dam and a river, for example. And then the addition of processes so uh, for example, we think of fire as something that's growing and understandably in California, and it absolutely is a huge problem. We're having mega fires right now. Up in, our, our colleagues up in Northern California, friends and family are really hurting. Um, but the Santa Monica Mountains, uh, uh, the, the issue for us, yes, we still have obviously with the Woolsey fire and all these things, but one of the issues causing problems with fire in Northern California and much of, much of our country is the fact that we've suppressed fire for so long. We've removed fire from these systems and then we've introduced all these more flammable critters and so it makes huge problems. In the case of the Santa Monica Mountains here, um, we've actually introduced more fire. So we actually have more fire ignitions, more, more, more starts of fire here than before uh, European uh, settlement here. So we've actually, um, even though in most of, the, most of California, we have fewer starts compared to historically, or, or, or the fires that start aren't, aren't as extensive, it's, that's the reverse here in, Santa Monica, in the Santa Monica Mountains. So we've introduced things, critters, structures, dynamics, processes. Um, speaking of what I just said before, we've also radically changed our disturbance regimes. Uh, fire is an example, flooding is an example, um, uh, things are being perturbed at different rates than they historically were. Our systems that were once intact are mostly now fragmented in, in much of our country, not everywhere, but much of our country. Uh, and so think of roads through the Santa Monica Mountains. We're staying with the example of the Santa Monica Mountains. And that um, dissociates parts, physically separates parts of our ecosystem and makes it harder for critters to move in between, materials to move back and forth, et cetera. Sometimes we do restoration um, to uh, do something sexy. Sometimes we do it to recover a charismatic flora fauna. Just this week, the, one of the most recent press releases I saw from our colleagues in the Santa Monica Mountains was how many kittens were born, how many baby mountain lions were born uh, this, from May to August in the Santa Monica Mountains and the Simi Hills, which is cool, awesome. I think there was, does anybody remember? I think there was 14, 14 cubs that I think there were. Um, uh, great, cool, right? That's good. Um, all the talk that you'll see, or, or almost all the talk you'll see in the media about dealing with fragmentation in the Santa Monica Mountains rapidly turns to mountain lions. Mountain lions are our remnant apex predator. They weren't the original apex predator. Those are grizzly bears, but we killed the last one here in the state of California in 1934. But but uh, as far as terrestrial predators, they're pretty much our, our apex predator in, in our part of the world these days. Um, uh, 
it's okay to yes. recover. Uh, have we uh, and, ever yeah, have we Dan. ever considered um, reintroducing the grizzly to California? I would love it. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't think I, I I it would be great. Uh, so 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 an example would be wolves. So our wolves were also extirpated from California. Um, wolves are much less threatening critter than a grizzly bear. Um, uh, they've been, uh, because of the restoration of the gray wolves under the Endangered Species Act in essentially the Intermountain West, some of them have spilled over into Oregon. And about eight years ago, OR7, the first gray wolf in, I don't remember what it was, 80-something 80, 80 years, roamed a male with a collar, radio collar, so we knew that he was here, went from extreme southern Oregon into northern uh, California. And then, and then quickly went back to, to Oregon. Since then, now we're, we actually have more wolves and stuff. But, but that one act, that one just wolf kind of meandered in, set off a firestorm. And so California started down the policy road of working on recovery of wolves, right? How might we reintroduce wolves or how, or how might we... Actually, nobody was actively talking about, at least initially, nobody was actively talking about restoring wolves. It was just, if the wolves recolonize, we won't, we won't drive them back out. Just that has been very controversial. It's not controversial in LA. It's not controversial in San Francisco, but in you know um, El Dorado, in the counties of Northern California, rural Northern California that that rely on ranching and stuff, they really don't like wolves. And so, so I'd say the wolf is a much easier bar to cross than a grizzly bear, and and we're working on the gray wolf bar right now. So, uh, I think it would be great. I mean, we have evidence of grizzly bears eating whales, you know, grizzly bears eating um, uh, northern elephant seals, you know, so they were on the beach, they were up on the top of the Sierras, they were pretty much, they probably weren't in the, um, probably weren't in the deserts of, of, you know, sort of south, southeastern California, they probably weren't super abundant in the Central Valley where there was all these wetlands, but pretty much everywhere else, grizzly bears were throughout the entirety of of the state of California. And so in theory, we could restore them anywhere, but, but uh, uh, that's a great conversation. Let's, let's put a pin in it from when we, when we get, get back to talking about these sort of large scale dream restoration things. But, but yeah, I think it'd be great. I think the general public would have some issues with that as I would suggest. Um, cool, other questions or other comments or, or wonderings? Uh, yeah, um, I forgot if you're posting. Sorry, whoever that is, I, I can't quite hear you super low. Uh, hello yeah yeah um uh, i can't remember if you said that you were going to post the um the the powerpoint online i will i will okay cool thanks yeah i'll pause i'll post it as a pdf probably but yeah but i'll post it cool other questions all right let's get going How, what's our what's our time like man okay great uh, and then, and then another uh, reason these days that we, we people talk about doing restoration is maybe maybe the the um, area is relatively okay, but we're worried about a changing climate, and we're worried about what it's going to be like in 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years. So that's that historically was not very important. Increasingly, that's a major consideration and potential motivator for for doing different restoration activities. Okay. Um, Again, uh, uh, the challenges just continued. These are some more specific examples, but um, things that we have to deal with in restoration. Uh, so, the, so, so these guys, these guys were why we might want to do it. So, you know, oh, we had these invasive species, so let's do something about it. This is more as we're going to do the restoration. These are things that. Um, uh, uh, complicate our trying to do them. So first and foremost, fragmentation. So we don't have a big contiguous wetland. We have a little piece here, we have a little piece over there. We don't have a contiguous grassland. We got a patch here, we got a patch there. That's hugely problematic. Um, you know, birds, for example, can relatively easily go from patch A, potentially, to patch B, potentially. But many other things, caterpillars, snails, whatever, uh, much more difficult. Uh, next is we have a, a tremendous amount of land use restrictions. Some of you may be in our land use class. Um, 
and and what we're allowed to do on, through zoning and other other types of um, uh, uh, land uh, constraints um, have huge effects. So so if something is a farmland now and we restore it to a grassland, let's say. Um, the city or the county or whoever may lose tremendous amount of tax, a uh, tremendous amount of tax base. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, when we have a, a working farm, let's say, to keep that analogy going, we have a working farm um, is employing X number of people and producing, you know, Y amounts of food. But if we convert that to a, um, a cool grassland, probably not as many people are going to have an, make an active living off of that. We can be creative. That's not necessarily like if we could talk about a degraded river, restore that river, and there might be tons of fish in there and the fishing activity might, might be way better. But, but, but oftentimes we have to deal with this issue of when we do the restoration, we change the, the use of the area and that um, may or may not also engender knock on effects with government and funding and public uh, support. It's pretty much, I would say, impossible to do a restoration these days if we don't have at least some public support. Um, you can start with a little and grow that public support, but if everybody was just dead set against the, the, proc, the, the effort, it's probably not gonna go forward. Um, increasingly, to be successful with restoration, we recognize that we, we have to do these, these actions as an interdisciplinary effort. <clears throat> so again, historically, it was, so I'm trained as an ecologist, historically it was biologists that did this. Um, then with regards to wetlands, we realized um, that hydrology was super important. So how water moves on and around the landscape. So then it was, well, a biologist and a hydrologist have to get together. And then, you know, and things just sort of have, have grown. So. So having someone that can, can communicate with the public, can talk with them, communication experts, um, and on and on and on. The more successful restorations tend to be the ones that bring in folks from, from divergent disciplines and come together. We're pretty much gone unless we're up in the middle of, I don't know, some mountain chain in Alaska somewhere or something of that nature. We're pretty much gone from the days of only having one one technical expert be the, the guru for um, designing, implementing, managing a restoration. Related to that, another challenge that we'll see again and again is this issue of long-term uh, maintenance. <clears throat> Doing a restoration can be super fun. You know, out there driving tractors, out there planting plants. It's, it's, like, it's like my office, right? <laughs> it's, like, it's like cleaning my office. Uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, God, you know, putting in the office, painting the walls. Those are, that was fun. Building the shelves. That was cool. But, you know, the constantly keeping it clean, that sucks, you know. Um, and we see this throughout many of our human endeavors. But, um, you know, it's very hard to start a museum. But the starting of the museum is the sexy part, right? The fun part, the, the, the adrenaline part. How are we going to find the $5 million we need? We're going to do all these public education campaigns. And, and then we get some millionaires, somebody to donate some money. We create the museum. Awesome, right? That's super hard. I'm not, I'm not saying that isn't a, a challenge in and of itself, but it's very hard. But then we get it. The real challenge is now that we've started our museum, how do we, how do we hire the janitors? How do we have the cleaners? How do we have the, the security guards and all, all that kind of day-to-day -day stuff that's gonna go on for decades and decades and decades, that's much less sexy. In the case of restoration, a key thing, because these are natural systems, there are other potential perturbations. So maybe we got rid of an invasive species, but now all right, and we got rid of it and we did all this great stuff and we got all this press coverage and on all these awards and and everybody was super stoked and everybody was happy and kids are playing and all that kind of great stuff but then you know 10 years from now when a new plant comes over the horizon and starts invading uh this area we've restored how are we going to deal with that right and oftentimes there is no plan for that or the plans are incredibly pathetic and um and I can't tell you how many times this happens over and over and over again in, in ESRM in general, but, but in restoration in particular. Um, and then lastly here, in terms of the, the sort of ongoing challenges we need to be cognizant of, 
um, is this um, is when we do need to change public opinion, it can be it can be tough. Um, now, in, I have fire in here. In the last, I'd say, two or three years, this has gotten a lot better um, in terms of fire, at least. People are freaking out with these mega fires, Woolsey, Thomas, um, you, you know, the, the fires up north right now, all the different complexes, fires, um, uh, paradise, you know, all that stuff has made people a bit more supportive of fire, but not entirely. And, and, it, and just like our question we had about the grizzly bears, right, it, it, it really can be a long slog to get the public to be on board. You, you can start, as long as you have a little bit of wiggle room, you can build it, but um, it takes some time. And I'll, I'll share some horror stories of some of the projects I've worked on with some of the silly propaganda and, uh, and uh, just silly um, attitudes that have been uh, perpetuated. Okay, um, so what is re ecological restoration? How are we doing on time? We'll do it, go for a little bit, then we'll take a, we'll take a little stretch. Um, two, two more quotes, and then I think we'll be done with quotes for a while. So the first is, I, I, there's a million, you guys have been doing your readings. There's a, there's a bunch of diff different definitions of what is ecological restoration. I'm gonna start with this quote from the Society for Ecological Restoration. Society for Ecological Restoration is a professional organization that um, was created to serve folks that are doing ecological restoration. Because ecological restoration is mostly a non-academic thing, because it's mostly done by consultants, um, this organization is, is dominated by um, folks outside of academia. There's a lot of academics in there too now, but um, it's, it's really a, a, a more of a professional organization than we might say an academic organization. Okay, and so this is from a, a, one of their uh, publications, uh, in, but they, they define ecological restoration as the process of assisting the recovery and management of ecological integrity. Ecological integrity includes a critical range of variability in biodiversity, ecological processes, the, the, the goings on, the interactions of things, and structures. Structures being the physical objects, the height of the plants, the the, the shape of the, of the cliff, um, um, the curve in the river. So biodiversity, processes, structures, as well as regional and historical content and cultural practices. So therefore that could mean things like um, traditional Native American burning of, of, of fields or, um, or, or uh, capturing fish or something of that nature. Um, so that's the Society of Ecological, Def Ecological Restoration's definition. And then here is one from, so Northern Arizona University has been doing restoration for some time. They're pretty much extreme, uh, almost exclusively focused on forest work. So they basically have a school of forestry. Um, so while, even though they, they don't do all types of restoration, they've done a lot of great thinking. They have some fantastic people there that have thought about the concept of how you do uh, how you restore um, wooded ecosystems and stuff. And, and from one of their uh, publications, um, they define ecological restoration as a broad conceptual framework for helping ecosystems recover more nearly natural structure and function while providing for continued use by humans. What you'd expect from a forestry school, right? A school that's built around um, um, silviculture, built around encouraging wood to grow so that we could harvest the wood and use it. They continue on, for ecological restoration to proceed on sound scientific footing, it must be rooted in the best knowledge available with careful reasoned analysis checked against factual evidence. So, okay, so similar to the first definition, um, a focus on structure and function, okay? So the processes and the physical uh, elements of the of the system, but then they have the, there's all this focus on facts, <laughs> uh, you know, testing reality, making sure stuff is going to work, right? Experts, evidence, that kind of stuff. The fact that they um, uh, include that should signal to you that historically that hasn't always been the case in terms of our, our ecological restoration. Thoughts on those first couple definitions? 
and maybe informed by some of the stuff you guys were reading this week? Anybody? No thoughts. Excellent. Let's see. What if I call on some people? Oh my God, he's going to call on me? Oh my God, wait, 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 hold on. Wait, what? Uh, let's see. How about um, Brian? Brian, any thoughts on those couple definitions? But they seem to make sense. They seem similar, different. What would you say? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I got okay. it. Um, it seems like it reflects slightly different uh, value systems. Like, like you were saying, one's more of a preservationist versus a conservationist. Mm -hmm. um, Good. I'm wondering how those kind of, if there's any kind of conflict between uh, kind of people who are doing this kind of work in, in the, between those two like ideological values. Yeah, no, great question. Yeah, so and, and absolutely, there there could be right. There could be between um, uh, uh, the utilitarian side and, and the, that might want to make uh, like let's say uh, in the case of trees, maybe they all want to restore tall, uh, you know, um, easily cut downable trees, so more straight up and down trees. Whereas maybe more the preservationist folks maybe wouldn't care so much for that. Maybe they they don't mind if the trees kind of have you know branches, more like oak type of oak tree type of morphology. So absolutely that could come into play. Good, good. Uh, Clay, any thoughts on these couple definitions, first couple definitions? Yeah, I, um, I kind of agree with Brian too about how it just kind of depends on where your viewpoint's coming from and um, your priorities in general of um, restoration. Like from the article you sent us, you can um, look at it like a carbon copy. Um, <laughs> which I think would be the kind of best management of when from reading through them to kind of replicate uh, an ecosystem to its original form without trying to um, tweak it too much or force it, you know? Good. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so it, it, you know, first principles, you know, if, if there was a, uh, on this hillside, if there was a coastal sage scrub community, probably, and, if, and a fire came through or, I don't know, a meteorite struck or something, we wanted to, to fix that system, you know, picking a coastal sage scrub community is probably the, you know, that's of course the starting point. Like, all right, let's check it out. So, so that's definitely a good, a good starting point. How about one more? Uh, anybody else or I'll call on one more person. Uh, how about Angelica? Sorry, my house is kind of noisy. It's all good. It's all good. Um, so, so any thoughts on these couple, couple uh, definitions? Well, honestly, or? like, I had kind of have a hard time understanding what ecological restoration was. So the quote, this one's specifically on the screen. I pretty much just reading it, understand it. So I like it, I guess. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, and, and again, what is, re we'll, we'll talk about it. We're, we're going to keep talking about this now, from here on out, but, but you know, what is ecological restoration? It's kind of like, oh, you know, again, uh, we could drive by something and there's a yeah. sign that says, here's a, here's a wetland restoration. You could, at one level, you're like, oh, that's, that's ecological restoration. But, yeah. but at the more conceptual level, you're right. It can be hard. And we say conservation biology. We say a lot of these things that we just toss out a lot of times. Yeah. Like you and, think you put the definition, but then again, you like think about it and you're just like, oh, I don't know. Never mind. Sure. Yeah. So great. So these, and these are, you know, definitions maybe you guys prefer your own tweaked version of it right or, or combining these things or something totally different and it's it's all good one of the challenges that we have in ecology in general environmental science we don't tend to so we're not dorks and i don't mean this in a negative way but <laughs> we're not uh, as geeky as the physicists <laughs> um, so we're in, we're in physics world. They make up terms like quark, muon, right? All that kind of stuff. You say quark, I don't know what the hell a quark is. So when we enter the discipline, it's I don't what's that? I read up in a textbook or somewhere, and it defines a quark as this type of particle. Ah, uh, now I understand what quark is, because we so often use terms like restoration, um, predation. Um, uh, you know, growth, you know, all these terms that are common terms in the English language. It's much easier for our terms 
to for people to hear them and think they they have they know what we're talking about and and we might have this idea in our head the person speaking or 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 the person that is generating the information might have a different uh definition so because we use these easier to understand terms in one sense that's great in the other sense it, it would be a lot easier if instead of calling this ecological restoration, we called it, uh, I don't know, flarky flark or something, right? Because you wouldn't know what the hell flarky flark is and, and we would have to define it. Um, so this notion of, of not entirely sure what these, what these definitions are, it's a cool thing to have. It's a normal thing to have. Just make sure you guys, when you do go start cranking through stuff, you look at a couple different definitions when we do use these common terms like competition uh, predation, et cetera. Cool. Any other quick comments before we go on? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, it may be kind of stupid, but all of these myths that we're reading about, are these technically like what not to do as an ecologist? Like is like the methods, I mean, as far as the way they're structured, like, is it, I don't know. Yeah. So I would say, I would say there's th things you should be cautious of. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, uh, so, it, um, <sighs> It gets to assumptions, right? Yeah. And so um, uh, there's implicit assumptions and explicit assumptions, right? So explicit assumptions would be, um, so for example, for writing a paper on ecological restoration, it's best to throw our definition of it in there, right? Or if we're doing a paper on, on restoration success, what, is, what the hell do we mean by restoration success? Define it in that paper. Mm -hmm. And then we can have our conversation. And so if we define it, it's okay. Because then as we're going on, if someone disagrees with me, are they disagreeing with my results or my, my interpretation? Or are they disagreeing with the whole premise of restoration success or something, right? And so, so if you assume my definition or, 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 or I'm, I'm being explicit about my assumption about this, um, then when I go down through the when I go and do my stuff, we, we could talk about those two different things. Well, I disagree with your assumption. If your assumption was what right, then you'd be correct, but your assumption is wrong. Yeah. The problem with many things in, um, in our society in general right now, not just ecological restoration, is that we are not explicit about our assumptions. And so the, the talking about the myths or that notion of using the, the device of a myth it doesn't necessarily say that that is, uh, is, um, is wrong, but it, it's saying that to just assume blindly that this is always going to be the case is, is probably wrong. Got it. So, so it doesn't say that, you know, uh, so the Jane Lubchenco quote I had up there, which was, you know, the myth that what worked in the past is going to work in the present. That doesn't mean that the stuff that worked in the past can't work in the present, but it means you should check yourself and make sure that you have good reason to think that that specific effort that worked in the past will specifically work here in the future. Got and it. by pointing out as a myth, it forces us to have that conversation like, ooh, you know, and if we have a conversation and we decide that, yeah, this thing is good to go, then that's cool. The, the, usually people use that, that device of the myth because they see people doing this all the time and they're not examining their assumptions. And so that, that, that's, that's what that's about. Does that make sense? Yes, very much. Thank you. Okay, cool. Any other, any other comments or, or uh, wonderings or questions people had? Have? I do, Professor. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering, wouldn't it behoove the restoration community to come up with a one sentence um, <laughs> description of it? And then from there, they can each go into their own niche. So maybe have that guy Tuft come up with a, uh, one sentence thing that describes it. I mean, we got to get all of these groups to come together if, if anything's going to ever get accomplished. Yeah. So I think, I think so that, 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 that's a great goal. I like that idea of, can we just, you know, turn it into a nugget and make it as nuggetized as possible that we can share. Um, I would say these, these last couple definitions um, uh, are, are trying to do what you guys are talking about. But they're, they are draft, they are generated by experts in the field that have been pummeled by various things. And so, you know, in one sense, we could say restoration is restoring, uh, uh, ecological restoration is the recovery of biogeochemical functioning of a plot of land, 
right? We can say something simple like that. So we could definitely do that. Maybe that's a good exercise we should do as a class. Um, um, but that, uh, I think these definitions are trying to be more practical in terms of how they're actually done and the things that we need to consider. But you're right, but that's a, but that's a great comment. I like that. Maybe, maybe we'll, we'll make that an assignment in a future week or something to try to see if we can point how, how, how many people can do an effective definition with as few a words as po few words as possible. So that's good. Thank other you. thoughts? Yeah. Other other comments? Okay. So with that, I think what we'll do. Let me just check. Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna take a pause here. So we're gonna take our ten minute break. Everybody stretch. Go get your power bars and whatever. Um, I'll pause the recording um, during our breaks. I, I haven't always remembered to do that, but I'm gonna pause our recording. And um, and it's my clock says nine fifty one. So we're going to come back at 10.01 by my clock. So 10 minutes. You can start your timer. Um, and I will uh, uh, pause the recording. And I'll see everybody in 10 minutes. Uh, today. Okay, guys, we'll start in a minute here. Um, and, uh, and we'll get going. Um, so any questions about we have probably 30 seconds more before I said to go my stopwatch is still going. Okay. Um, all right, here we go. 10 minutes. Good. Recording's back on, here we go. So uh, this is, I think, for you guys in an introductory restoration ecology class, I think this is the most important figure that I'll share with you all semester. <clears throat> um, this is a famous figure from this paper by these guys, Hobbs and Norton. Um, people have critiqued it and there's there's different iterations and versions of it uh, and, and those critiques all have validity and everything but from from our perspective here which is you guys were for example we we're just talking about before the break what is uh restoration right what, what what is you know what is it um so for for you guys to keep in your head for uh, the general public, if we're introducing a project, and we wanted to talk to the folks about um, what we want to do. I think this is an incredibly useful figure. I use it all the time. So let's orient ourselves to this conceptual explanation of what restoration is. On the x-axis, we have this, um, and again, sorry, you guys can see my, my uh, pointer here, correct? When I'm moving it? Yeah. Yeah, okay, good, yeah. thanks. Okay, so okay, so on the x-axis here, we have some measure of time that's arbitrary. Maybe it's uh, weeks, maybe it's months, maybe it's years, maybe it's decades, it, it doesn't matter. But so we're going from uh, now or, or one point in time into the future as we go to the right. On the y-axis here, we have some measure of ecological complexity or ecological function or biogeochemical function. Um, and so what we're, the whole thing we're trying to do with restoration is we're starting at time zero or time, time now or time early. And by definition, we're starting with the degraded state, right? So if it wasn't degraded, if the system wasn't messed up in some way, shape or form, compromised in some way, shape or form, we wouldn't, we wouldn't need to do any restoration, right? So there's something amiss with the system. Okay. You know, the extreme example that is easy to use is a Walmart parking lot, right? So we used to have a wetland, now it's a Walmart parking lot. So we're starting with that degraded state. We're starting with the, the no plants there, no birds making nests, all that stuff. What we are trying to do with restoration is this green line here. Um, and so uh, we're starting with this bad point in time we're trying to get to a better point in time. That better point in time is a desired state of functioning. It's, a, it's, it's uh, more bird nesting, it's a uh, greater extent of plants, more species of, of insects, you know, wh whatever floats your boat and whatever you've decided is, is, your, um, is your thing. So that's what we're trying to do with restoration, 
right, at a conceptual level. What rarely, I would say, rarely if ever do we do we get to that, at least at, at least at if we're talking about restorations of any realistic size, you know, maybe, maybe a small little, uh, our front yard, if we were restoring the, the wetland in our front yard or something, but anything of, of significant scale, rarely do we get to des the desired state, um, at least quickly. Much more typically, we get to this olive green condition. So much more typically, we, we start with a messed up level of stuff, we do some things, and those things shove us after a period of time into this uh, a better condition, right? So the level of functioning is improved, but it, it's not the, the ideal state. It's not the desired. It's not the full, the complete goal of the project. Um, I would argue that's still better than the degraded state. It's not as good as the fully functioning system, but, but that's still an improvement. We might not have 100 bird nests, but we have... 45 bird nests. And while not perfect, at least we have some amount of bird reproduction happening. What we really, really want to avoid is the, is the pink line, right? So the pink line is where we start to do something. So here we have our degraded state. We start going up this curve. We start improving over time, but then something happens. Uh, maybe it's an additional perturbation. Maybe it's just we didn't design the restoration correctly, whatever. But, but the, regardless of how, the functioning degrades and we see subsequent decline back to the level of, of functioning that we began with. Uh, or even worse, and this is typically what will ha happen with many of these systems if we don't do anything, many of these systems will start at this level and actually will continue to degrade. You can't get any worse than a Walmart parking lot. Uh, well, well, I guess you could. I guess it could be like a... Uh, a nuclear radioactive repository on a parking lot, I guess, is worse. But, but you know what I'm saying, right? Many of these things will continue to get worse. The invaders will continue to increasingly dominate. The abundance of, of squirrels will go down, you know, wh whatever the case is. So this, is, this really explains what we're trying to do. We are trying, so take home number one is, is this is conceptual map by Hobbes and Norton. We want to go from a degraded state to a well-functioning state. Cool? Make sense? All right, cool. Um, there's more I want to say on that, but, but for now I want to step back for a second and just talk about some similar terms that, we, that are bantied about as, we, as the semester creeps on and we start reading more, um, more things. These things, these terms may well come into uh, play. So, so reclamation, rehabilitation, restoration, um, uh, all kinds of similar terms have been put forward by certain authors, and um, and some people really love their their terms. Um, I'd say these are reasonable to know of. The main one we will use is restoration. Um, restoration, you can think of it as, uh, say, going from that Walmart parking lot to a well-functioning um, uh, ecosystem, right, wetland. Rehabilitation uh, restores some aspects of the system, but is not trying to um, restore everything. So rehabilitation might be to do something from... Um, something along the lines of maybe putting some bioswales in that, um, in that uh, a parking lot. So putting a bioswale is a good thing, right? We're, we're helping to deal with some of the wastewater, that rainwater that comes off that um, area, provides some habitat for some plants, right, and stuff. So, so it's, not, it's not nothing, but, but I wouldn't call that restoration, right? I would call that some, something else. Reclamation is a term that is usually applied, again, when we're not trying to do a full restoration, but we have something that's so screwed up, we know we're not gonna be able to typically take it back to the system pre-disturbance, um, but we want some benefits. So an example of reclamation would be something like, say in the desert Southwest, where we have massive, or we've, we've had massive overgrazing. Let's say the cattle have compacted the soil and, and plants, you know, it's a hard pan now, 
and plants aren't growing there. It's just, it, there's no, there's no biological crusts or anything. It's just, it's just a sort of wasteland kind of thing. So, so reclamation, maybe we wouldn't do a, a, um, a full wetland there, but we might do some kind of, you know, park type of setting. And so we're reclaiming some level of ecological functioning from a highly degraded system. We're not, we're not pretending to get back to the original state, but we're trying to make it um, uh, better than, than it currently is. So restoration is typically what we're gonna be talking about in, in our class. Um, I think these are more important terms for you guys to know. So I will try to be using these terms as we talk about stuff throughout our class. Um, and and I, think, I think these should be easier to understand. And I think these are, are more useful as we explore different types of restoration projects, et cetera. Um, enhancement. Enhancement is, uh, you can think of as tweaking, right? So enhancement would be an effort to improve the structure, um, uh, species composition, et cetera. Not necessarily to the original state. It could be pushing them that way, but, but it just is trying to, the focus on enhancement is usually much more narrow. So we're worried about flood protection. Uh, we're worried about fire prevention, something of that nature. So we're gonna do something. We're, gonna, we're definitely gonna improve the functioning of the, of the system, but sort of one spoke on the bicycle wheel, right? We're not trying to recreate the whole wheel. Um, Again, this is one that is often done in highly disturbed landscapes where um, doing a, a full, full blown restoration would be very difficult, very costly, very um, uh, time intensive, et cetera. So enhancement is narrowly focused, usually narrowly focused in terms of time and budget, and also usually narrowly focused in looking at one element of um, the one or a few just a few elements of the ecological functioning of the system. So for example, here I listed um, uh, um, introducing some endangered species, right? So maybe we're not gonna uh, fix the trees, maybe we're not gonna fix the hydrology, maybe we're not gonna change all this stuff, but we're gonna um, release a mountain lion cub here kind of thing. Or much more typically in our neck of the woods, um, here's a, an area with a bunch of invasive mustard or a bunch of invasive plants. We're going to go chop all those plants down, herbicide it, and try to kill that invasive plant. Um, and, and, and that's a laudable goal. That, that's a useful thing. We're not transforming the, the soil. We're not messing around with the insect population. We're not seeding with this. We're just doing this, this enhancement to try to uh, deal with the... Um, uh, individual problem. Uh, we will use these terms. Again, in the wider public, these things are all mixed up. And you'll hear people talk about doing an invasive species control effort as a restoration. I don't, I don't think that's appropriate, um, but you will hear people call that a restoration. But in our class, we would call that an, an enhancement type of project. Uh, the next, again, the main thing we're talking about is, is doing restoration, where we're trying to, to replumb or redo the physical structure, the organismal representation, the composition, and the ecological interactions amongst stuff. So structure in this case would be the physical structure, the underlying rocks, the underlying slope, that kind of stuff. Composition would be the, the, the composition of organisms, so how many species do we have, for example, and then the function is the going on, how they interact, predation, reproduction, that kind of stuff. That's restoration. The last one is really, really difficult and, uh, and is, is rarely, if ever, succeeds. Um, uh, and so that is this notion of creation. And so that idea historically wasn't done much, uh, increasingly, people are talking more and more about this, primarily because of climate change. So, for example, what do I mean by creation? Creation is we have a, um, we have a, what would be an example? We have a grassland, and we want to, uh, and we've determined that uh, uh, it's going to 
start getting really hot or something here. And it's gonna to be too hot to support, say, this, this local uh, mouse, this mouse species or whatever, right? So we might decide that we wanna convert this area into a forest, right? With the idea that, oh, the forest would create more shade, the shade would ameliorate the temperatures, cut down some of the drying winds, and, and then this mouse might be able to live in the shadow of, this, um, of these trees, might be able to persist. Or alternatively, um, maybe, the, uh, uh, maybe something only existed uh, into Baja, California, and its range never went into Southern California, let's say. Well, because of climate change, because things are getting hotter and hotter, uh, these, let's be specific, a butterfly. Let's talk about a butterfly species. So this butterfly lives down here in Baja. Um, it's getting hotter and hotter. Um, uh, the plant that it feeds off of, right, both as the, in the larva stage and also as the adult stage, nectar, nectar source or something like that, these uh, uh, plants only exist in Baja. So maybe what we want to do is maybe we want to create a, a, a life raft for this butterfly in Orange County or something like that, or Ventura County or something. And so to do that, we need to plant these plants, the food plants, the nursery plants, the nectar plants for these butterfly. But maybe for these, for these uh, plants to grow, they need very specific amounts of water, et cetera. So that would require us going to one of our grasslands or one of our coastal sage scrubs, destroying our coastal sage scrub, replacing that with this other um, vegetative community, and then eventually with the butterfly. So that would be an example of creation. So we do that more and more because we're worried that we're losing those ecosystems because of uh, climate change and all the other associated human stressors. So enhancement, one thing, tweaking, think of uh, invasive species control, weed, weed management. Restoration, the typical thing. We had a wetland, it got messed up. We want to make a, a help, uh, you know, fix that wetland. Creation, we have a grassland, we want to turn that into a, a wetland that never was, uh, where there never was a wetland before. Does that make sense? So enhancement, restoration, okay. creation, those are the... Those are the most important terms. Yeah, Emily. Um, when, what about creation when people are creating something like a man-made lake in a community for aesthetic purposes? Um, does that still qualify as creation? Ooh, great question, great question. I would say no. Well, it, well, I guess in theory it could, but generally speaking, I would say no, because they're not, they're not um, take something like, uh, what's, it, what's the one up there called? Um, like Sherwood, right? Around, around uh, Westlake, that, and all, I guess West, Westlake itself actually as well. So Westlake, there was a little lake. I think like Sherwood, there was a little lake. But then what developers did in the 60s and 70s or whatever is they, is they did what uh, Annalise is talking about, right? So they, they, they took this area that wasn't a lake and they massively expanded it. Um, they, they weren't trying to, the, so that was an aesthetic thing or a, or a structural thing. So they wanted water, right? They didn't want um, uh, phytoplankton. They didn't want a diverse wetland around the edge to manage sediment going in there. They didn't, they didn't try to replicate the whole ecosystem. They just essentially drove around with a bulldozer. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously oversimplifying. Drive around the bulldozer and scooped it out, filled it up with water, put some cement structures around the areas where they maybe needed to, to fix the, the bank's edge. And that's basically it. So if you go to places like, um, I think, yeah, we had to drop off hay at this lady's house uh, during the pandemic. And she lived in that development that um, Sher Sherwood, Lake Sherwood or whatever it's called. And so I, I, I think I was there one time, like 16 years ago, we moved down here just when we were looking around, but I've never been back. I, w I went back to that place. As I was driving around the lake, what you see are these massive aerators. Yeah. Right? So these big oxygen generators. Why? Because they screwed up the system, right? That system is not a well-functioning system. And, it, and because of the runoff and the sediment and the, and the, and the nutrients and everything, it can't support a, a, a healthy, vibrant uh, lake ecosystem, right? So they have to do all these constant perturbations, perturbations, perturbations. 
And that's because that wasn't part of their design, right? The design didn't include having robust plant communities, robust fish communities, robust sediment management practices, et cetera. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. So yeah, so, so, so this is, all these terms are in the spirit of, of improving functioning, right? Even in the creation where I say we're doing something totally novel, the idea is to further the sustainability and the perpetuation, let's say, of an endangered species. Um, even though it might technically be screwing, the, <laughs> screwing over the species that are there, right? The, the goal is still an ecological one. The goal is still an environmental one. So Lake Powell or Lake Mead would also not be considered creation because they literally Correct. were put there for water. Correct. Correct. Now, I mean, that's not to say that you couldn't design a dam that, that, that was an ecological creation, like a restoration type of an approach. You could do that. But the way those have been done, no. It was purely an engineering thing, purely a, a put, uh, put uh, uh, you know, concrete on the ground and, and run with it type deal. Other questions or other, other thoughts on that? Does that make sense? Okay, so we have, so again, mostly we're talking about restoration, but if we're going crazy, you know, insane, uh, redo the world, you know, Elon Musk, you know, terraforming something totally new, we call that creation. And if it's something that's just very, very um, singular focus, we call that enhancement. The vast majority of stuff though, we'll talk about, we'll just call restorations. Um, when we, uh, so let, let, let's talk now about our, 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 that middle example. So restoration. So when we do a restoration as again, this will more on this throughout the, <clears throat> excuse me, throughout the semester, but, um, as a, as way of brief introduction, we have to first figure out why we need to do it. So we first have to understand what the stressor is, what the degraded function is. Oh my gosh, there's no birds here. Oh my gosh, there's no natives here. Oh my gosh, there's hardly any earthworms here, or, you know, whatever, whatever the deal is. So first we need to um, do some type of monitoring and inventorying. Um, and one of the things we would have done if, if we were a regular semester is we would go out and do a little, little demo of this, but it's, it's okay. Um, so basically we do some type of looking at the system, the functioning of the system and describe what's going on. Um, for, I mean, if we're doing something out in the bitter root wilderness or something in the, you know, Alaska Northern Slope, I suppose not, but pretty much everywhere else that we're probably gonna be working in, that you would work in, in your career or where we'll be living, um, we really have people in and around these systems. So not only is that inventorying and looking at the system about the, the biological geochemical state of affairs, but it's also how are people using this. So is there a trailer park right next to us? Is there a school over here? Is there a, a 101 freeway right next to us, right? So we, we need to, we do this assessment and figure out what we need to do. Um, it, it needs to include the human sphere as well as the natural sphere. Uh, and then once we do that, okay, so we, have, well, we decide we have a problem. We don't have enough birds. We don't have enough this. That. Okay. Oh, that sucks. We need more birds. Let's go do it. So um, then we need to identify the goals and objectives of the project, okay? Super, super, super important. Let me say that again, massively important. Probably the most important step of the restoration, of, uh, the whole restoration thing, with the possible exception of the ongoing maintenance over long-term. But, but, but um, really, really key is what are we trying to do? We need, it's, it's great to start off and say, we're trying to fix the environment, right? It's okay to have a sentence like that or an opening paragraph like that, but we need to be specific, okay? Way too often, you will find restorations that say things like, oh, wow, uh, this place sucks and we want some more native species, right? <laughs> Lame, right? Much better to say, we want at least 75% cover of native vegetation within five years, right? That's a, a goal and objective that's very, very clear. Historically, for totally understandable reasons, okay, you guys have taken an ecology class, you guys are taking conservation biology, you guys are taking all these great things, chemistry, right? 
our scientific mothers and fathers have been working on these subjects for ever, right? For long, 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 long time. The modern science of restoration, people have been doing the restorations, you know, Romans did stuff, the French did stuff, the Chinese did stuff. But, but as far as we would consider as a, as a modern science, it's only a few decades, right? It's very, very young. It's really since the 1970s, really. Even though Aldo Leopold and other folks were doing experiments in the 40s, et cetera, really the modern approach is only a couple decades long. So um, when we were, especially early on, we were starting out, people weren't sure how it was gonna work, right? And so there was a bit of uh, flubbing, right? There was a bit of smudging. There was a bit of, yeah, we're going to make this better than it is, right? But don't be too specific because then someone can look and say, oh my God, you didn't do what you said you're going to do, right? So, so early on in restoration, and this has persisted in a lot of places, we haven't been as precise as we should be. So we want to identify goals. It's fine to have a general goal. But then but right below it, you should say, but what I specifically mean is, you know, so the general goal could be something like fewer invasive species. Awesome, right? Or we want native species to dominate. Awesome. But what I specifically mean is invasives are no greater than 10% cover of, at any, you know, square meter on the, on the project site. Um, this also is one that um, should not solely, and this is a great example of where we need, so maybe the first thing, maybe the assessing the, the need, maybe we hire the biologist, or maybe you guys do your, your insect survey or your seed survey, right? So we're using an expert in that discipline and she's rocking it and she gives us a report and that's great. As soon as we get to the goals though, we really need to make sure we do, we are bringing the interdisciplinarity together. So uh, one of the ways to do that is to have, uh, community engagement, stakeholder buy-in, right? Not, not just buy-in, that's that's not, that's an incorrect term. Um, true community engagement. So we put together our, we the biological hydrologists, chemists, you know, whatever, we the experts come together and go, oh, there's some pollution here. This is how we have to deal with the soil. And so we kind of get our thoughts together. Then we come together with the public, go, hey, here's our goals. Our goals are to have no heavy metals in the soil, or have heavy metals be lower than one part per billion or you know, whatever, the, whatever the standard is. And so we talk about this and then we hear what the public says. And a lot of times the public will say things like, well, you know, it's great that you're gonna do all this restoration stuff, but um, I wanna go on a walk with my kid or I wanna be able to ride my bike or I wanna take my dog on a walk. And I thought you said you're not gonna allow any dogs because they scare the endangered birds, right? So this is the place to start those conversations at the goal and objective setting point. And I mean, it, it doesn't always work this way. And it, it sometimes it, because logistics, it can't always work because of timeline sometimes, but we want the broader community involved with the goals and objectives. That will lead to more acceptance and that'll help short circuit any, uh, community distrust or any community um, uh, lack of support in the future, right? So the earlier we can bring folks in, the better. Okay, next, after we've decided what our goals and objectives are, then we're gonna, we're gonna have to prioritize stuff. And literally this is, this is like, just like in an earthquake or a war or whatever, where we have to triage. We have to, there's a whole lot, almost always, virtually always, there'll be more stuff than you can do or the budget would be just insane. So we have to, of those idealized goals and objectives, we have to prioritize. Well, actually, yeah, it'd be great to have the insects and the birds and the this and the that and the da da da, da. but really we need to make sure that we have, let's say, the, the water flowing correctly first. And then we need to make sure we have the, the vegetative community coming in and then, you know, something like that. So we need to do some level of prioritization. Then once we have that done, we would uh, design how we're, what we're gonna do. Okay, so we're gonna, let's say we need five tractors for two months to be driving around, or we need to hire some plant propagator to grow up 10,000 oak trees, you know, whatever it is. So we, we go through the design phase uh, and, and, and work it all out. And that's also where we figure out the, the true budget. This is really gonna cost X thousands of dollars or X millions of dollars or whatever. We go and do it. We go and do the restoration. And then comes the evaluation phase. Again, historically, there was very little of this. 
now in places like California, at least, we do have things that say, so it used to say, you know, say in the late 80s or so, you'd say, oh, we got this messed up Walmart parking lot. And the plan would say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna rip out the concrete and we're gonna make, a, make an area and then we're gonna plant some plants. And if it holds water, we're good to go. And so people would be like, ooh, 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 boom, next project. And the, it would look great for a day and it would look great for a week and it would look great for a month. And then it would, the first rains would come and it would go to crap and then something would happen and it would, and it, so, you know, just blah. So for most projects, for rigorous projects, we need to not just do it and walk away. We need to do it and then monitor. Is it functioning the way we thought it would function? Is it working the way we thought it would working or we would work? Again, having those very specific objectives, 25% cover of this endangered species or something like that, that's, the, the monitoring makes it much easier. We can go out and say, hey, do we have, do we have 25% uh, cover? Without specific goals, it gets super smudgy, super, super, you know, uh, undefined, and then it just, it just bad things happen. Um, over time, we need to do the maintenance, as we mentioned before. Sorry, I'm about to sneeze for a second. Excuse me. I got the COVID, oh my God. Um, so uh, uh, we got the, uh, so do the maintenance. So that could take different forms. Maybe every year you know, in the spring, we go and do some weeding of invasives. Maybe we do some trapping for, for cats or, or other potential predators. You know, it could take many forms depending on what we're talking about, but some level of, of, of checking and correcting some of the, the system. And then lastly is this idea that uh, became very, very sexy in the mid to late 90s. Um, and everybody in the world said it. In fact, you can see it still in a lot of these uh, publications and guidances and almost nobody did it. What adaptive management means is, is essentially what uh, anybody that owns land or, or runs land. Let's think of a farmer. Let's think of a farmer. So what is adaptive management? Adaptive management, how does a farmer manage his or her farm? Well, they say, okay, here's, here's, my, here's my crops and I'm growing my crops and make a lot of crops and sell my crops and it's all good. And I plant some more crops next year. Ha, huh, but these crops don't grow as fast. So there's something up. Oh my gosh, I got to water them more. Oh my gosh, I got to give them more fertilizer, right? Or, or whatever. And so he or she had a plan and then as they're going along something the reality deviated and so then we need to adapt the management by adding materials by doing a different practice by doing something that's all that adaptive management is it, it it's it's what you would do right if you had a backyard and you had a lawn or you had some fruit trees and you went out and all of a sudden one year there's the fruit's all dying and the trees are dying, you would, you would change. You would change your watering. You would call on an expert. How do I fix it? And you would, you would do something, right? That has not, generally speaking, happened in restoration. So because of a variety of things, primarily because of the legal context and the cost associated with this, particularly adaptive management at large scales, at the scale of the Everglades, at the scale of San Francisco Bay, at, you know, these kind of big projects, um, essentially to get the money from a legislature or Congress or something like that, or for that matter, a private donor, they don't want to hear that Dr. A is going to try to, um, uh, <laughs> they don't want to hear that I'm going to try to restore Ormond Beach, right? They're not going to give me money for that. They're going to give me money to restore Ormond Beach. And I'm going to tell them, yep, and in 10 years, we're going to have a healthy functioning wetland, right? So because of those constrictors, uh, we generally speaking have not built adapt adapt adaptation into our restoration plans. We absolutely need to. But because of s s historical, social, cultural reasons, we don't. And that's caused a lot of projects to start going well. Maybe we're doing our maintenance, but then something changes but we don't have the wherewithal to adapt the management. Um, so, so, okay, so to summarize, idealized restoration, we assess there's something wrong, we identify our goals, we prioritize what we, what we want, what's the most, what are the most important things to do and what we're gonna do first, and what we can leave to a little bit later. Then we do the full design and the actual 
actual doing of the restoration, the planting of the plants, the, the driving of the tractors, whatever. Then we monitor to see what's working. And uh, hopefully that's in an adaptive management context. So when we, if we find something is not going right, we can, we can tweak and adjust the, the activities we're doing. And, and there's constant maintenance, constant checking, surveillance, and tweaking of things. So that's restoration in a nutshell. Make sense? Any questions about that? We'll, we'll, we'll address this you know, many times over the semester, but this is just sort of the, the first intro. Okay, um, a couple other things with, with factors that are, that are influencing success. Um, and we could, we could write these up and, and, and it would probably be a fun exercise at some point to do this with you guys, but, but there's all different types of ways of, of expressing the fact, simple fact that there's many things that go into a successful restoration a really, a really um, you know, impactful uh, effort. Everything from values to the, the ecological conditions on the ground, to how much we actually know about the system, to the, our, our community and social commitment. Ideally, we have a biocentric value system. That really helps. Ideally, we have a relatively healthy system that's not too messed up. That really helps in making things more successful. Ideally, we know a ton about the system. When, when you or I have a question about plants, we can go look at the Jepson Manual, this big Bible of plants in California. We actually now have it online. You can actually just go Google it and, and what's this plant, right? California is the, is the most diverse state in the U.S. in terms of its, its flora. When I work in Louisiana, we don't have that. We don't have a, a one master book of all of the vegetation in Louisiana. That's a huge problem. Um, we don't have a master list of all the dragonflies in Louisiana. We don't have a master list of all the, well, we kind of have some, I guess we have a good list of spiders, but you know what I'm saying? I mean, so, so knowing what's, when I work in Turkey, there literally is nothing, literally, literally, literally is nothing. And so I had to create a lot of that um, myself. And so, so ideally we have some rich data and expertise and people understand the critters that are here, they understand the system, that's gonna lead to more likely success in terms of our, our efforts that we do. And then that our community is really committed to this, that, we, that there's really buy-in, everybody sees value in this, it's great for the kids, it's great for the retired folks, everybody. That's all of those dimensions, and we can think of probably many more, um, really foster the prob or, or increase the probability of us having a successful restoration. Um, and then uh, the last, or the, or the, excuse me, excuse me, the next take home today, we're probably gonna run out of time, but the next take home um, is that um, how restoration has historically been done is not the way we see it in textbooks or, or that kind of stuff. Historically, the way restoration was done was by best guess. So those things we were just mentioning, uh, you know, the idealized way to follow through, the idealized way of monitoring, you know, very specific goals. Nope, that's not traditionally how most of our restorations have been done. And so these are all quotes from actual restorations that I was um, either working on or was assessing for people. And so um, this first one, so I'm, I'm going up to this uh, 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 un, unnamed place uh, in, um, in Central California. And uh, there's, they're planning a bunch of, it was a woodland restoration. So they were restoring a bunch of oak woodlands and uh, the trees um, didn't, you know, they grew for a year or two or whatever it was, a couple of years, and then they were, they all kind of died or most, many of them did. And so I said, oh, uh, so what happened here? Like, why, why, did, why did this fail? And the answer was, you know, maybe this, maybe that, but it probably had to do with El Nino, because there was an El Nino year there then. Um, hmm, that's, that's interesting. Another one was um, a similar a woodland site up in this case, Northern California, and all the, the trees were also dead at that site. And so I was talking to this, this person that was in charge of the restoration. I said, you know, so what, what happened to all these trees? And he said, ah, 
I bet you it was Vols, right? It, he didn't say it was Vols. He didn't say, oh, I found all this evidence of, of cause Vols, these little rodents, they, they, um, they like to eat the bark of young trees. And so they'll go like with their teeth and they'll, they'll scratch through the bark to get to the cambium, the actively growing area, it tastes good. And then they sometimes will go around like that. And if they do, they can gird the baby tree and then the fluids don't flow in the tree and they basically die, right? So this guy said, I bet you it was voles. And I said, oh, so did you, did you have evidence of you know, this girding? Yeah, no, probably, that's probably what happened, right? Like, what the F, right? And then the last one is, my favorite one is like, why did this restoration fail? This case was a wetland, I think. <laughs> this guy's like, this is just a weird place. This is a weird place. Yeah, that's just weird here. Uh, that, those answers are unacceptable, I would propose to you. Um, I, I totally get it that something happens and you don't know why it happened, but it behooves you as the restoration person to figure out what is going on, right? And the, the very fact that these, these are all different people, they're all consultants, that they were all doing this in different places, the fact they could tell me with a straight face, probably had something to do with El Nino, bet you it was Foles, just a weird place, with a straight face, tells me that they didn't, um, well, maybe I shouldn't say they didn't care, but it wasn't a priori priority to them to figure out what was going on. And that comes, and that fosters a community of restoration by best guess. So if you don't know that El Nino caused your problem, if you don't know that these rodents were problematic to your vegetation, you're gonna keep sh guessing. You're gonna keep shooting from the hip, right? Associated with this best guessing is this historically lack of monitoring, lack of eva evaluation, or overly simplistic evaluation. All of these lead to sub, you know, less than ideal restoration and therefore less than ideal ecological functioning ultimately over the long term. That make sense? Okay, so we're gonna do an exercise in a second here. Um, so we'll come back to this uh, maybe next week, depending on how long this exercise takes us. Um, but so uh, uh, wetlands, we're gonna talk a lot about wetlands in this class, especially uh, in an upcoming lecture. You guys, are, you guys are reading about wetlands this coming week. Um, your, your first first readings on wetlands. Um, long story short, we are losing, we've lost a tremendous amount of our wetlands that used to exist. In uh, California, we've lost 91% of the wetlands that were here about 150 years ago. Uh, you know, essentially the time when California was founded, basically, compared to now. I'll say that again. We have lost 91% of our wetlands in the state of California. I haven't updated this in the last couple of years, the wildfires. Possibly it's even worse if some of the wildfires have destroyed some stuff. Um, Dr. Fairfax is um, one of her main thrusts of her scholarship is how we can use things like beavers to, to increase the amount of wetlands and, and all that great stuff. But, but by and large, California, we've lost 91% of our wetlands. Only 9% remain. Those 9% aren't, aren't, rocking and rolling and kicking butt. Those 9% are mostly compromised and fragmented and degraded in some way, shape or form. I'm just referring to the, to the aerial extent, to the actual acreage of wetland. We've lost 91% of our wetlands. If we talk about places like the San Francisco Bay Area, we've lost 95% of those wetlands. And so I like this photo, I've been using this photo for a long time. This is a oblique, right, of the San Francisco Bay Area. And essentially, not entirely, but for the most part, the, the gray that you see in here, so, so there's this gray that's, that's lining the, the edge of the San Francisco Bay, virtually all of that used to be wetlands uh, and, uh, and, and is no longer. So our wetlands are, are, are pretty uh, stressed. Um, as I said before, most of the ones that do exist are fragmented and degraded. So if you look at, in this case, this is a, this is a, a wet, this is not a wetland, this is a grassland, but, but you can still see, it, it, I like it, it shows up really nice on the infrared images. So here's, this is my old restoration site that I, that I ran for several years. Um, anyway, this is, so this is on the, the edge of the Stanford campus. And what we see here is, this is a false infrared, the, the orangey color, that's grassland. 
The other things are non-grasslands. So this is urbanized area. This is some, these are some trees, but you can just see from this little shot here, it's not one big massive smooge, smudge of orange, right? There is, in this case right here, this is the, um, what is that? I can't remember the, not the 101. Um, can't remember anyway it's a freeway <laughs> i'm getting old the freeway this is a linear accelerator a you know a physics experiment um there is a there is a, a lake here a, a a wetland here but you know everything is sliced and diced and there's this triangle of property there's this um uh, rectangle of property there's this trapezoid you know everything's fragmented and degraded and the same happens with our wetlands in many of our systems so um so we do have some real challenges here and uh, restoration is a natural response to deal with this stuff. Because of these, these challenges, many people, how are we doing on time? Okay. Um, uh, many people are uh, uh, increasingly thinking, oh, hey, this is something we should do. We should probably fix this, right? This, this Walmart parking lot, or this abandoned property or this whatever. And this is just a couple of random grabs of, of headlines where, where people are talking about doing um, restoration. As a consequence, there's been increasing interest in restoration efforts over the years. This is an old figure. You are gonna, we're gonna look and see if this is still the case. So for what I'm showing you here is on the x-axis, these, these, these are, this is time over about 20 years. So from the early 80s to the early 2000s. And we're going from, and, and this is number here. So in this first graph, we're talking about the term restoration success. So what I did, and what you guys are gonna do in a minute, is we're gonna go to some of our databases, some of our, our scholarly databases, where we have academic journals and articles uh, uh, warehoused in these databases. And we're just gonna do a query, and that's all I did. So I went and I said, hey, in, in uh, 1995, I searched for the term restoration and success. Uh, and I said, how many, how many papers use the term restoration and success? Now, some of this might have been uh, somebody was doing uh, the success of a, uh, uh, I don't know, um, the success of a cattle rearing production company or something like that, right? So, so it's not all exactly precise, but the big trends hold up is what we're looking for. So we said, okay, so 1995, how many papers were published on restoration success? And this was the number, I don't know, what is it, 50 something, 50, right? And what you see is over time, we had, there was a few papers about this, and it was kind of bumping up and down, a few here and there, a few here and there, the weird and dirty people like me are like, restoration success. But then over time, something happens in the early 90s, and we start to see this increasing interest in this notion of restoration success, and we see more and more papers published with it. That's when I did the search term with just restoration and success, using this database called Biosis. Um, then I did the same thing, but added the word wetland. So I also want to see, let's do the same thing, but just what, when somebody's doing a, a study on, or writing a paper on wetlands. And we see essentially the same trend. It's not as dramatic, but we see essentially the same trend, whereas it starts with nothing here in the early 80s, or no papers. Then there's a little bit, like a little burp, 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 and then a little burp, burp, burp more, and then burp, it goes down, and burp, it goes up. And then, but then we start on this, this upward trend, right? Same thing if we use some other terms that might, that we've just mentioned, things like adaptive management, same thing. Early on in the 80s, people weren't really talking about these actively, you know, efforts to, to improve and, and see if we're really meeting our targets. As we go through time, the term picks up popularity. And now again, this doesn't guarantee that, that people are doing more adaptive projects, but it at least says that in the, in the conceptualization of the experts, this is becoming a more important concept at a minimum, right? And so we see that's going up, burp, 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 burp. cool. So essentially, um, the question is, did this continue? So early 2000s, right? So things seem to be going on, a, on an upward um, trajectory. Did it continue? Or after, after 2001, did it decline? Did it stay the same? What have you? Let's find out. So what we're going to do next is, uh, is simply see, is there still increasing interest in these, in these ideas? So we're going to do a little bit of a literature search. This is going to do two things. One, we're going to answer the question in for ourselves in terms of our, the interest of, of these, these concepts in, in, in the context of restoration. 
Um, and so we're going to search biosis, but this is also going to help you guys start to get familiar, if you're not already, with just doing some queries in the library and, and looking up literature on your own. So we have a couple different terms here. Um, so uh, uh, we're just right up to our break. So um, I'm going to introduce this. We'll start our break, and then we'll come back, and I'll reintroduce this, and we'll we'll go into small we'll go into breakout rooms to do this. But I just want to finish up real quick. So what we're going to do is you guys are going to search for the term restoration success, and then you're going to do another search with restoration success and the term wetland. Make sense? And so, uh, so one group is going to do restoration success. One, uh, one of the breakout groups. One of the breakout groups is going to do restoration success and wetland. One's going to do adaptive management. One's going to do adaptive management and wetland. One, oh, I'll put you guys in six groups. One's going to do restoration performance. And the sixth group will do restoration performance and wetland. And then we're going to find it. We're going to get the data and you guys are going to type it into a Google sheet. So we're going to be able to look for ourselves to see if that trend is increasing. Uh, I'll go over this again when we come back from the break, but conceptually that makes sense what we're doing? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay, good. So we'll take, we'll take our break and um, I got 1050, so we'll come right back at 11. Awesome. Thanks, you guys. All right, team, we got about 30 seconds and we'll get going. I'm in my class. Okay. 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 Let's keep going where we left off, you guys. So, in a second. I'm going to toss everybody into um, a breakout room, being six different breakout rooms. And again, we're going to do a quick literature search. And we're trying to figure out um, over time how things are changing with regards to these, these concepts, uh, these restoration ecology concepts. Again, one group will get, will get uh, restoration success, and, <clears throat> and then another will get restoration success with wetland, Adaptive management, adaptive management with wetland, and then restoration performance and restoration performance with wetland. Each of these would be one one search query. So let me just um, let me just show you guys. Wait a second, how do I do this? Okay, so we're going to get into breakout rooms. You guys are going to log on to the library databases, and then um, you'll search the terms and you'll put them into this spreadsheet. So let me show you this over here. So I, I posted earlier in the chat a link to this, this, uh, this uh, Google Sheet. But just to show you, this is, this is a bit more general. We're just going to do the biosis version here. And if you look, it says here's database biosis, which is the one we're going to be using. Here's uh, for the folks that are doing the search term restoration success. They're going to do the query. I'll show you how to do that in a sec. You're going to do the query and then they're going to say, uh, now I, I've, I've made an extensive year from 1969 to 2020. Your databases may or may not go back beyond 1980 or 1970. So you may, might not be able to get some of this data, but as, mu as much as you can do from now to from, from uh, 2020, uh, now 2020 will only be a partial year because we're not done yet, but still we should do it anyway. Um, so we'll do that and it goes far back as you can. So I, do, I did the query and then I, let's say for 1989, I found there was 17. I'm just going to type in 17, et cetera, right? Uh, uh, and so here's group one, group two, group three, group four, just to sort of I can keep track of, of who's doing what. So they're not all on top of each other um, is the idea here. And that's it. If you get confused, you can just click this link. This will take you to um, our library um, database. You have, to, you have to log in first because you have to sign in that you're actually a CSUCI person. But that's, that's the process. So once you get logged in, um, I'm going to uh, show you what, how you can do this. You can follow that link and just authenticate, or you can start from MyCI. 
and sorry, I'm, I'm talking here, but I can't hear you, but is this, everybody following me? Am I doing okay? People, yep. okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. okay, so we log into um, uh, MyCI, and then I'm gonna click, it may be pinned, it may not be, but somewhere you're gonna find your library resources, services. You can do the same thing getting in through the library portal itself, same, same idea. It's gonna take us to the library, and here we are in the library. I'm now gonna hit the databases um, search tool, now let me just make a quick, and then here's all the different databases. And so um, uh, next week, I want you guys to do a little bit more of this to so get more familiar, but, but today's initial one. Um, I'll just say that when we talk to our, our great librarian friends and we say, hey, I'm looking for an article, sometimes they send us to these uh, much more broad search, uh, search tools, which are great. For the purpose of this, we're trying to really stay narrow on more of the professional publications, generally speaking. So we don't want to use this big blanket, anybody said the word ever. Instead, we're, we're primarily focused on, for example, biosis. If I click this, it'll say, this is life sciences and biomedical research covering blah, 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 and experimental research methods from 1926 to present. So this is, this is going to be focused on life science stuff, right? So we might miss some of the environmental engineering articles in this particular database, right? But, but nevertheless, it, it's real, it, it is focused. So we're gonna check this, this one out. So now, now that I'm logged in, I can just click that link. Uh, if my internet works, I'm supposed to just click that link. What's going on here? Okay, all right. So now each of these databases will look a little different, okay? So, um, for the purposes of this, I like you guys to use the more advanced search tools. Of course, if you're just playing around and you're like looking for a paper, you, you're more than welcome to jump on into the basic search. This one says 1969 to 2020 is the range. But I'm gonna hit advanced search, okay? I'm still in this. Now, um, uh, I'm gonna do, um, what do we, let's make something up. Let's make a uh, restoration insects or something, right? So I'm going to do first term and an insect. I'm not going to say insects. I could use a. I could use a wild card. Is this too small? Can you guys, maybe this is a little small on your screens at home. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Yes, thank you. Sorry. Okay. So, so right. So yeah, so I clicked on biosis and then whatever the term, whatever the tool is, um, eventually when you use other search engines, use the, use the advanced search. Some of them have multiple boxes where I could put the word restoration and then another box where I could put the term insect and then, you know, like that kind of thing. So they're going to vary a little bit, but I'm going to have, term one and term two. And then I'm gonna say, uh, I'll, I'll do it the first way, I'll just hit search and let's see what happens. Yeah, what's up with my internet all of a sudden? Okay. Something screwed up. All right, let's try this. Hmm. Why is that not working? It says there's no restoration insects. Okay, hmm. that's weird. Let's try. Are you sure you don't need a talking code? And then the example, it says TS equals, and they're doing like coding. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, right, 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 right. right. Okay, so let's do, this. let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do basic and we'll put it in here. Sorry. Okay, that, that works. Okay, so, um, so we do this. So I have these, these terms in here, right? Um, this is going to look, look in the title. This is going to look in the abstract. This is going to look in the keywords. It's going to look all around, right? So that advanced one, thank you, Bella, whoever said that. That Yeah, I should have said, should have specified everything. But So type it in and check it out. It says 
Here's the, the answer. Can I get larger? Yes, yeah, sorry. So I typed in my search terms and I said go, and then it gave me these things. And if I wanted to read these, I could I could click on the the paper and 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 read it. And if if we we had existing um, uh, uh, access to it, you can just click a link and you can actually get the full paper. Otherwise, if we didn't have access, you could request an interlibrary loan if you wanted this paper. But the point is, I did that search and it came up with two thousand nine hundred and two. Uh, uh, papers, okay? But for our purpose, if you recall, we want to know the number of papers in 1971, in 1978, in 1983. So what I'm going to do now instead is I'm going to pick, let's just say like 2018, for example. And by clicking these, I, I can refine this further. I can say 2018 to 2018. I can do various things, but we're going to do it by year. So then, um, I do this, I think. Man, I'm losing this slow. It must be maybe campus is slow. Okay, so now look. So now this we, we now we've ju we're just looking at the answers in this one year in in 2018, and it says there's 173. It also says right here there's 173. So I would then jump over to my website or excuse me, the, the spreadsheet, I'd go down to 1973, and if it was restoration success, I would put, type 173, like that. Does that make sense? Makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so this is what we're gonna do. So we're gonna, um, to do this communally, so, uh, and we're gonna break into groups of six groups, so there's gonna be about five people in a group. And so, um, to toss you guys into groups, um, uh, and I believe when you guys go into breakout groups, it says you're in breakout group one, right? Or you're in breakout group two or three or something. Is that right? When you guys do that? Yeah. yeah okay. So I'm going to toss everybody to break breakout group. You guys start introducing yourselves and then I'll post in the chat to everyone, you know, the group one is doing restoration success and group two is doing restoration success in wetlands. Make sense? And then you guys can, um, individually, you guys can, you guys can decide who's going to do the first five years and who's doing the next five years so you guys can divide it up. And so we're dividing and conquering. So everybody should know how to work, in this case, biosis. You're gonna do it and then you're gonna come back here and type it in. Does that make sense? So I'm gonna toss this uh, into breakout groups for, let's, I don't know how long it's gonna take. Let's try, let's try 15 minutes. Hopefully that's plenty of time. Can you then, um, send the link again? Uh, yeah, for this spreadsheet, sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, let's let me do it this way. I got it, Doctor. Are oh, you reposted it? Yeah. Okay. Oh, cool. Thanks. Thank yeah. you. Okay. So I'm going to toss everybody into uh, a group for the first uh, two three minutes while I'm sending out the info. You guys just introduce yourselves to each other, talk about how the day's going, and then and all that good stuff. And so right now I have what time do I have right now? It's eleven eleven. So I'll bring us back at a. Well, I'll check in at 11.26. If it's taking you guys a lot longer, we can have more time. But, but hopefully by um, 11.26, we'll, we'll pop back and we can share communally what we did. Cool. All right. Let me toss everybody into breakout groups. I have one more question. Oh, yeah. So when we're doing these searches, so mm -hmm. for instance, like restoration success and say if we had wetlands, mm -hmm. we'd have in parentheses restoration success and parentheses and uh, like wetlands. In parentheses. Yes, yes. Yeah, that would be ideal. Uh, yeah, so I would do restoration and success and wetlands. Okay, because I know sometimes they'll pull up other information. Right. So I would try the and first, and if it gets you some weird thing, then you can okay. just try typing the words nakedly. All right, thank you. Cool, cool. Okay, so uh, group one.
So I have a question about where you have your Zoom link. I could only find it in the email that you had sent out last week before the first. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It should be when you, okay, let's, so I'll resend it again. But um, if you go to our homepage, the, the, the landing page in CIE yeah. Keys, and then go down, there's a green button. Mm -hmm. you just hit that button and the link's embedded in there. So if you click that button, it'll, it'll take you. Okay, I'm gonna try it real quick just so I can okay. find it. Okay. And as it looks like everybody's done, I think I'm gonna suck everybody out. Okay, so it's the start class one. Yeah, sorry, okay. yeah, start class. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So if we're done doing what we're supposed to, we should come back to the mainstream? Yeah, I'm closing it right now. Okay. I'm closing everybody right now. I'm, I'm just a little paranoid about ending things early. I've, I'm still figuring out this online thing. I believe we all are. Totally. Oh, I should read the yeah, okay, good. Ah, oh, Chris sounds like he was like he was super stoked to be finishing that assignment. It sounds like a very challenging assignment that wind. I, I was I was wrestling with my uh, my roommate's kitten over here. Nice. He just now laid down, but he was like giving me a, an issue when transferring from the breakout room. So nice. Could, the sigh was towards him. <laughs> One of our uh, one of our rabbits needs medicine, so my wife needed help wrangling. He's run behind a couch, so I had to just before class. Sorry, I had to go down and see if I, I, I failed utterly. I was not able to get him, so she had to do it all herself. But which is typical. But uh, a new uh, extreme yeah. sport: indoor That's rabbit right. wrangling. Yes, rabbit wrangling. All right, cool. Looks like everybody's back. I think. Yep. Good. Great. All right, cool. So thanks, you guys. Um, uh, still trying to figure, again, I'm still figuring out this online thing. I, I'd rather us do more of these interactive things early and, and often, but today was kind of, we had sort of the backgrounder stuff, so I needed to go through that. So hopefully we'll be doing more, um, more engaging things rather than me just talking all the time um, as, as we go on to the semester. But um, so great. So hopefully that was okay. And it looks like everybody now knows how to at least do the basic query and can do things by years and, and all that good stuff. So um, let's just take a look at our question, which is what, uh, sorry, you guys can't see my screen yet. Let me share my screen. Before we go into that, it was kind of interesting that we would do these searches exactly the same, but our numbers that came back were so totally different. Really? Yeah. One of us would get 152 and the others would get 110. It's like, what happened there? And the, the, what we know. put into the search engine was exactly the same. Ooh, I don't know. That shouldn't happen. So sometimes be, uh, what happened for me was you, the, the, I searched all databases and not just the BIOS's preview. Ah. And that brought up a vastly different number than what it gotcha. should have been. Gotcha. So, um, yeah. So, so, so maybe you guys had different, different domain, even though like you typed in the words the same, but maybe the year setting, the domain setting or something was, was, Tweak. I mean, it's, it's best for one person to do this, right? Because one person would do it and then he or she would change it to 2018 and 27. And then you, you would avoid any of those unintentional errors that might crop in. But, but, um, but, but great. Yeah, the answer is it shouldn't. When we all search for uh, 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 rabbits and wetlands in 2017 in that particular database, configured the same way it should not return different different uh, values so um i suspect it was something like that so uh, that, that something was was ticked on somebody's but not on somebody else's um other than that it worked went okay though yeah you guys everybody's able to figure it out and make sense okay so let's just take a quick look oh sorry somebody had a question no i said even i was able to do it even the reddit so we're rocking and rolling that's great i love it 
Um, okay, so let's just see what the answer was, right? So, so did, has the interest continued? So everybody can see my screen, I hope. Make this a little bit bigger, let me close this thing. Um, oops, let me close this thing in my way. Okay, so let's, let's uh, take a look. So this first one is, let's get rid of that. So this first one, this is a restoration success. And so there we go. So, so obviously 2020 is not a valid comparison. It's only halfway through, right? So there's still another several months of the year left, but also probably several, uh, this, this month's, you know, September's data is probably not yet in the database, et cetera. So this is probably not a valid um, point. But again, starting very low to nothing in the 70s, little teeny burp in the 80s or so, not much, 90s, and then sort of mid 90s, the interest starts to peak. Uh, that's when I started doing restoration. It must be, it must be me, clearly. That's the only possible explanation. And so, you know, boom, 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 boom. And it, it looks to be a pretty steady rise. Now we do have some gaps here and there, but when we look at the overall picture, it looks like we're on a steady rise. So restoration is, restoration and success generally more popular terms. If we do restoration and success in wetlands, it's a more noisy relationship as we might expect, but nevertheless, it's still, it's still generally speaking on, a, on an upward trend. Again, we see that same interesting uh, uh, sort of large jump. Normally the jumps are relatively small from year to year, but we have this, uh, this big jump. So, so both restoration successes going, gro gro growing in popularity and restoration success in wetlands. And if we add in, um, if we look at uh, um, adaptive management, same thing, writ large, again, very little, uh, starting more like the mid 70s um, rather than the, the 80s as with restoration success. But nevertheless, it starts to get pick up, but, but nobody really does much with it till about the mid, actually not even the mid 90s, mid 90s a little bit, but really it seems to start its big sw swoosh up in the, the early 2000s and it's more or less on that continuous rise. If we ask if people are doing that with regards to wetlands specifically, again, it's also showing the same general upward trend, but, but more noisy uh, given that the sample sizes are smaller. And then lastly, an, a related term, we haven't talked about this, but, but it's related, restoration performance, uh, similar to restoration success. Again, relatively little, boom, it's, it's pretty, pretty steady rise. And then when we add in restoration performance and wetlands, it's again that noisy relationship, it's still up. So that tells us that, that overall we are still trend, people are still interested in this. And on average, every year there's more interest. So um, again, that doesn't tell us that people are actually uh, getting more success or getting more adaptive management, but at least tells us that in the, in the thinking of the professional community, this is a, a, a concept that is, um, is only increasing in, uh, in popularity. Cool? So great, so we answered that question. So stuff didn't stop, the interest didn't stop in the early 2000s, it continued on. Um, all right, so it's now 1140. I think we're gonna pretty much call it for today. We have, others, we have more things to talk about, but you know, we'll, just, we'll end it here. We, we don't have to uh, get everything done every single day. So we'll, we'll pick up our conversation and start talking a bit more about what this success is. When we talk about success, conceptually, what, what do we mean by success, um, et cetera. Uh, one last thing I wanna just uh, put in the chat uh, for everybody is our Poll Everywhere. So again, we're, we're, we're trying this new Poll Everywhere as opposed to the uh, Poll Within Zoom because the Zoom thing is, is weird and hard to, uh, hard to deal with. So I'm just gonna toss this little link right in here. So um, I'll hang out for a bit if you guys have questions, but just real quickly, um, again, I, I redid the links and, and all that. So people that had issues with stuff in Canvas, some people couldn't see things, some people could, but, but regardless, it should all be good now. I will be posting all of our PDFs, et cetera, within, I uh, see I learned from now, I'm not trying to link them from some Google document or whatever. You'll also notice that, or maybe you did or didn't, but the, the Google, um, the Google sheet that I shared is from my personal account, Littoral Pirate at Gmail. Um, I, some of the problems also seem to be there's something about the Dolphin Pod permissioning. Um, and so, so I might just, if I share things like this in the future, just so you know, um, it, it, it will probably be coming from my personal Gmail as opposed to the campus Gmail. Shouldn't matter to you. The links will all work and everything. I'll make everybody able to do it. But I think some of the problems people were having had something that I don't fully understand about the dolphin pod permissioning. So I, I'm just going to avoid that and, 
and everybody should be good. So, so all the stuff should be there. Again, if you haven't taken our quizzes because of that problem, I've, I've given you guys uh, extension till this weekend, but please take those quizzes. In particular, please, the field safety thing. We can watch the video, uh, do the form, and then just take the, that three question uh, quiz. Um, and you should be should be good. If you guys could do that field thing to the field safety thing today, I'd appreciate it just because we're trying to trying to move on to start planning some field trips and the sooner we get that going, the better. Um, uh, do our readings, et cetera. Uh, take our take our poll everywhere survey, our anonymous survey about how I did today in this lecture. Give me some feedback. And other than that, I'm just gonna hang out for 10 minutes if you guys wanna ask me questions or any other logistical uh, things. I had, I had one question just real quick. If people did lose the, um, lose our Zoom link. Again, if you just go to our, our, our welcoming page, the landing page inside CI Learn, that green button that says start class, you just click that. So if you ever misplace our, um, our uh, uh, Zoom link, you can always go there and just click on that from, any, from your phone or anything and it should take you into the Zoom. That's all I got today. Everybody wash your hands, stay safe. Don't uh, don't drink and drive on the crazy Labor Day weekend, and I hope you guys have a good have a good uh, long weekend. Thank you. Thanks. Thank guys. you. Have a good weekend. Thanks, Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. I have a quick question. Yeah, please. Um, so since I was withdrawn, it's still not your class still isn't popping up on my Canvas. Uh, you said I so I can't 